Hi everybody, I hope you're all well. I thought I'd make a bit of a different video today from what I normally do, so I hope that's okay. Um, basically, I wanted to share with you a game that I really enjoy playing, but I don't see very much about on YouTube or any other kind of social stuff. Um, it's a game which doesn't require a great deal of setup. Uh, a lot of the games we play here are historical, so there's loads of history setup involved. My gaming group um, that I play with regularly, we all we all play this game. Often when we're trying to decide what we're going to play, we simply ring each other up or text or whatever and say, do you fancy this? People say yes, because everybody enjoys it. Everyone who I've introduced to this game has gone and bought a set. Um, and basically I just wanted to list off the reasons to you why I play Dead Man's Hand. Dead Man's Hand is the scenery. I'm a big fan of westerns and I just love the whole aesthetic. So this is my Dead Man's Hand board. I've just set up an example here so I can show you. I've got four um, standard buildings, one which is two stories and then I bought the church. The board was really easy to make and the buildings are all removable so I can I can move them around it's just the base plates there that are sealed but all of them have the same floor plan size so you can swap them around um, there's other the sets like the gallows all of which have the same base plate so I can mix things up a little bit but you get to create lovely scenes to fight over um, my board here is just a two by two um, I have another two by two which I'm going to expand it into um, but to be honest we've played on this now for nearly two years and we've never had a problem with it at all because we're playing on a slightly smaller area i just compensated with more scenery so block lines of fire that being said being a western you have to have a street that you can have a gunfight down so yeah reason number one i love the scenery this scenery here is um was released around about the time of the curse of dead man's hand to show a ruined town and I really like that um, it's it just there's lots of opportunities for sneaking in and out of buildings poking your gun through saw holes or dropping down on top of someone who isn't very aware of you so yeah that's uh, one of the first big draws for me was all of the scenery and the terrain and the modeling opportunities second reason that I really enjoy playing Dead Man's Hand is to do with the model count or rather the, the lack of model count. So what you can see in front of you is my entire Desperados gang, which is the gang I use most of the time. Um, if you see my other videos, you know I play a lot of historical war games with high model counts. I've got over a thousand Napoleonic miniatures. I've got close to 200 Wars of the Roses miniatures. And it can be quite a feat to get it all set out and on the table. Whereas this, that this is it. This is the maximum number of troops that I'm ever gonna use in the game. Now there are about, I think it's about 15, 16 separate gangs at the moment and this is one of the ones that came to base set, this is the Desperados and every gang is led by a boss. So here is my boss which is this guy who looks a bit like Clint did in Pale Rider and every gang will also have a gun hand. Now the gun hand is sort of the, the lieutenant, he, uh, mine for the Desperados is called a killer. Here he is, and there's no, they are normally the best at shooting, or they've got their, they're the best at combat ability somehow. They've usually got some little gnarly rule. My guy has got the bandolier on there, so he never runs out of ammo. So even if his gun jams, this guy just carries on shooting. He just pulls out another one. Everybody else is just referred to as dudes, who are your sort of, if you like, your standard uh, fair and then you've got amateurs and amateurs are really the lowest of the low and these can represent either so 
you get a real mix of them. Uh, most of them are armed with pistols, but you usually get a couple of guys who have got some different. So you can see here I've got a fellow with a repeater. So he's worth quite a bit on the game, although my guy never hits anything. Then I've got three guys who are armed with pistols. I've got this union looking chap, um, and a confederate chap, and then this renegade here, which is quite cool. And then finally, I've got this William H. Bonney looking character armed with a double barrel shotgun which is brutal if you can get up close. That's it, that's, that's all I need. Um, there are points in this, although it's referred to as reputation, and a standard game would be 21 reputation, and that's a 21 reputation gang right there. The boss is usually six, then the gun hand is normally five, and then the dudes are normally two each. Um, do you, In the campaign mode, you can pay for extra weapons, however, basically they come armed as they are now in the core rulebook there are uh four base lists which i've got just here we have the law so your your typical lawman um so you can see they have a sheriff up to one marshal they have to have at least two deputies who can be armed with pistols rifle or repeaters and two can have shotguns and then you can just have some upstanding citizens so some great opportunities there for uh, for modeling Outlaws, bosses, gunslingers, dudes and varmints. And you can see each gang has got its own sort of special rules. Cowboys, pretty pretty standard. And then the ones that I use, which is the Desperados, which basically all their special rules revolve around not caring about everyone else in their gang and just shooting and carrying on and then carrying wounds into other phases. That's it. Every expansion has introduced more... Uh, gangs, uh, you can get the Australian one, you can get the Legend of Deadman's Hand, you can get the Curse of Deadman's Hand, and now they are just regularly putting them out. So I think uh, we've got in the mix in our game, we've got the Desperados, we've got the Banditos, we have just Cowboys, we've also got uh, Renegade Native Americans, we have the Mountain Men who are a real pain, and the other one which is a real pain is we have the Pinkertons as well. Um, I do have the Undead Faction from the Curse of Dead Man's Hand to paint up, um, but say it's not going to take very long because this is it. This is as far as the model count goes. You can buy mercenaries to put in your force. Um, basically any character that's ever been in a western probably has a figure somewhere on their store. You can even get hold of a DeLorean with a, a Doc Brown and uh, a guy that looks like Michael J. Fox if you want to play some special scenarios. And they have their own special rules um, to allow you to include them in their games. So. That's it, basically. You're looking at my complete army for that. So there's my second reason. So what do you need to play? Well, first of all, you need the rule book, which is this softback tome here. Um, very nicely illustrated, very simply set out and easy to follow. It's got a reference sheet at the front, which you'll be referring to a lot. And just why not, it's, it's got the one in the front is in centimeters and the one at the back is in inches. Then it's got a number of scenarios in here, plus the rules for the first four posses and a bit of an explanation of what various cards do in the game, which I'll show you how the mechanics work in just a second. On top of that, uh, you need tokens or markers. Now there is uh, ones you can photocopy from the book, but they do just make a set which you can uh, get and they're just done in MDF. And it comes with a little measuring stick as well, which is 10 centimeters long. And all you need dice wise is you could actually just do it with one of these, just a d20 and a d10. I just have two for two different sides. The markers are these are out of ammo markers, these are under fire markers, which are effectively wounds, and you have these which are movement markers. So, depending on how far your guy moves, he gets a marker on him, and that might make him harder to hit or harder for him to take tests. On top of that, the final thing is you need a deck of cards. So initiative is done on cards and each card as well has a specific rule on it. So you can see this one here, you should have killed me when you had the chance. That will be in your, if that's in your hand, you can play that when the circumstances allow. To play the game, uh, when you're setting up, you get, for example, if you are going to play the Desperados, you would get all of the black cards minus the king queen ace and jack of spades and you would form a deck here so this has got all of the spades and clubs in from normally minus the face cards 
and then I'd add the face cards for the clubs. And that's because the clubs have a Desperado suit. Later on in other expansions, when you buy sets, they actually come with their own special cards. So every faction has four cards unique to it, which effectively is their Jack, Queen, King, and Ace. And then that would go on top. So I would add mine into here, get rid of those, and I would shuffle these and then draw up. Um, you just need a playing area, so I've already got that, and a scenario to play. Now the scenarios are, are played out really nicely. Now we can get three games of this in normally in an hour and a half quite easily. And the way that works is that most, you could just play individual scenarios, but the way they've set it out in here is each of the scenarios is effectively a trilogy. It's done in scenes. So you can see here, we're, we're going to play the good, the lead and the ugly. And in the opening scene, The Stranger, it tells you what you need, the story so far, how to set the game up, how the play is going to work, and how the action is going to work. That then leads into this town ain't big enough, so depending on the outcome of this, it has an effect on the people you can take in the next game, or maybe the number of cards you're going to draw. And that then leads on to We'll Be Waiting, which in the first sort of um, scenario is an all-out gunfight. So it usually starts off big and builds better, uh, you might be start off having just a, a gunfight in the middle of town between two guys and then everything gets dragged in. That being said, if you don't want to play it like that, you can just grab gangs and just have a, a free-for-all. We've done that as well, um, which, it, which it can be great fun, but it can get very bloody very quickly. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put this down and then I'm going to show, show you the basic mechanics. Okay. I'm just going to show you the very basic mechanics of this game, which is my third reason of why I really like it, is it's to simplicity. It doesn't get bogged down in nitty-picky rules. You know, it, there's, you know, you just work, you roll dice, work out some modifiers, and then move on. It's a very cinematic game. So basically, you have to draw an issue. So I set up two, two, a small fight between two people here. Up high on the red side, we've got the guy with a repeater. And then down below, we have the Confederate cavalry guy with a pistol. And on the black side, we have the Union guy with a pistol. And we have the Billy the Kid lookalike coming around the corner with a shotgun. So on a turn, you would normally draw uh, blind a card for initiative. Now, the first one that you draw, you get to look at. So I would look at this and be a nine. Now I would decide secretly which of my models I want to assign that to. So for the sake of argument, let's say I'm gonna give it to him. The other player would do the same. He gets to look at the top one and he's gonna decide or he's gonna give that card to him. So now you would deal out the rest face down so you have no idea what these are so that first card can make all the difference because if it's a high card and you've got someone who's at close range and you want them to get in there and shoot before anyone else you might play it to him if it's a low card you might have some guy at the back or some guy who can afford to wait and you play it on him you both pick it up at the same time and put it down whoever puts their card down first wins ties for that round once the cards are down you flip them over so we know that this guy was going on a five and his partner down here is going on a six. The guy here was going on a nine and his partner is going on a four. And it goes in descending order from aces. You will have a hand of cards. So for argument's sake, let's just say we've got a hand of three cards. So you would keep these secret. So the black team here has a king, a six and a two. And now these would grant them abilities that they can use in the game. So you can see the king here, we started together, we'll end it together. Play at any time during the turn. All of your models may ignore the negative to hit modifiers for having under fire markers this turn. So under fire markers act a little bit like pin markers in bolt action. The more you have, the harder it is to hit. So we keep these secret. And over here for the reds, we have a six, an eight, and a five. Now, there are some cards in here like um, which let you swap initiative cards about. I hate them <laughs> because I always, it always happens to me when I've got an ace on somebody up high. 
um, and then it gets swapped for something else. So I like these little bits of trickery. This is the very handy card, Stumble. Play an opposing model at any point during the move action. It's turn immediately ends. So basically, if someone is moving their model across the board and you go, no, I don't want that, you play that from your card, Stumble, and you say, I want them to end it there. That's it, turn over. And if you've got a guy sitting up here and the guy's falling down in the street, that's just tough, you know, he gets shot at. So once you've um, dealt out initiative cards, you just go in descending order and you just move on into the main action phase. So we know that this guy here is going first. So I'll move this out of the way. And we'll have a look at what you can do. In Dead Man's Hand, a model's turn is made up of three actions. Now, there are some rules in the game that mean that people get less actions. Some models can start the game drunk and disorderly, which can be a bit of fun. But generally, everyone will get free. Now, you have to declare what all those actions are going to be before you execute any. Now, the actions you can take are move, aim, shoot, reload or change weapon, and recover. That's it. So, for example, with our fella here, he wants to try and make it over to... Uh, the barrels he wants to try and get into cover over here so he is going to take a move move and a shoot action and he is going to shoot at the confederate guy just there so he declares that those are his actions and so we use this this is 10 centimeters long so he can move one so he can go anywhere along that he's going to move the two he couldn't quite make it into cover, but now he's going to execute his third action, which is to shoot. Now, because he's moved twice, we put the marker with the two feet next to him, which is going to give him a penalty for shooting, but will also give a penalty to anyone shooting at him. So, we're now going to measure this out and I'll show you how shooting works. Shooting in Dead Man's Hand is worked out very, very simply. It just involves rolling a d20 and then adding modifiers to it and then looking at the shooting result chart that's in the book. Now, every weapon in here has a minimum and a maximum range, or most of them do, and you'll get various modifiers depending on how close or how far they are. Every weapon also has a maximum number of shots. So if you remember, I said you can take three actions. Those three actions for a pistol can be to shoot three times. And if you're at point blank range, that's gonna be particularly brutal. An example we've got going on here, this guy is going to fire at the Confederate over there. Now I've just measured this out and he is just over 20 centimeters away. If we look at his chart here, you can see that because of that, that means he is at long range. So, first of all, we look at what he is doing. He took two move actions, so he's going to take a minus one to his roll. He is also at long range, which means he's going to be at minus two. He hasn't aimed, he's not taking additional shots, and he's not on the mount, and he hasn't taken any hits yet. So we can see his modifiers are just going to be minus two. If this guy had been in cover, then that would have added more. So basically the roll is d20 minus 2. So 18 minus 2 is 16. 16 results in an under fire marker and a nerve test. So we pop the under fire marker onto our victim just there. And now he has to take a nerve test, which is effectively the morale system in the game. Now every model has a nerve value. So we look at the nerve value for a bandit, which is a dude for the Desperado. So you can see his nerve is three plus. And the way your nerve test works is you roll a d10 and you need to get over the nerve. If you pass, then nothing happens. If you fail, then he takes another under fire marker. The maximum number of under fire markers a model can take before it is removed from the game is equal, equal to its hit. So all of the people in the game we've got at the moment can take four before they're removed. The nerve test is modified by the number of hits already on him. So he already has one hit on him, so his nerve is modified by one, meaning he now needs to roll a four or more. So he passed, so he doesn't need to add an additional hit. That would be the end of that model's activation, and then we would move to the next highest card in, in order and then activate that. And so we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, now it's the red player's turn. 
and you can see that next in the initiative order is this guy and he got a six so he's going to take his turn so he took a hit already so his free actions he is going to take recover move and shoot and you just have to indicate basically where he's moving to he's going to move into the doorway of the building and try and take a shot at the guy that shot at him so recover basically means you get to remove a token for each recover action you take so if you took three recover actions you get rid of three tokens so that's his first action his second he's going to move into the doorway well we know he can make that so he's just going to sit there so he's now got a bit of cover and now he is going to shoot at his attacker and he is well within 20 centimeters so he's going to have a d20 you can see here that the pistol is at close range so at close range it suffers no modifiers he's moved once which doesn't give him a modifier and normally that would mean he'd just be on evens however his target has moved twice so he suffers minus two so he's on the same as the other guy was so he rolls a d20 and minus is two 12 minus 2 is 10 and if we look at the shooting result table that's not enough that's a miss the shot just goes pinging past this guy next in the initiative order is the guy up high now he's a little bit different now he's up high and he's got a repeater a repeater can take two shots in a turn and he's quite happy with his position up there so he's going to take an aim action and then he's going to fire twice at the guy down there now the profile of all of the models will tell you if they have actually any bonuses to their shoot characteristics. Normally it's just the boss and the killer. And as these guys are just bandits, you can see, no, there's no bonus. You can see here that the killer gets a plus two bonus and the boss gets a plus one bonus. So these guys aren't the greatest, but they're just doing what they can. So he is going to fire at him. now. Because he aims first of all, that gives him a plus one bonus to his next shoot action. So he's at plus one. The range of a repeater is 40 centimeters. So he's well within range. There is no bonus for being at close range for a repeater. So just for the aim action, he's at plus one. His target has moved twice. So that's a minus two. Meaning overall, he's got a minus one modifier to his first shot. Now, so he rolls 14. 14 minus 1 is 13 and we can see the guy just takes one under fire marker so he just clipped him he takes a hit now he's going to take his second shot now because it's his second shot he gets an additional minus one so that aim doesn't count for this action so he starts at minus one and the guy's taking two move actions so he's actually at minus three for this a 10 and as we saw before a 10 is a miss so that just goes pinging past him now finally over here, this guy is acting on a four. Now he's a shotgun guy, so he wants to get as close as possible because that, that gun is brutal at close range. So he sets his tar eyes on this guy here. So he is going to take three move actions right across. So he's gonna go one, and just as he's about to move again, the red player decides that he will play his stumble card. So as you can see, as I pointed out before, this means that the end, the action ends immediately and they lose any further actions. So the guy is just stuck in the middle there. That card is then discarded. And that was a quick turn. I'll, do, I'll carry on doing this turn just to show a few other um, actions. Basically what you do, you would draw up if you've used any of your cards. The black player hasn't. The red guy did, so he draws one card. So if you burn through your cards quickly, you don't get them all back. You only draw one a turn as long as you've played one. Now we do the same again. So we look at this and decide who to play it on. Six. See, that's quite hard because that's a middle card. So he's going to play that over there on the shotgun guy. As I say, normally this would be done simultaneously. Nine. He's going to play it up there in the hopes that he comes first. And then this one goes in blind. And this one goes in blind. You only shuffle the decks when you've gone all the way through them. So now we turn them over. Nine up there. Oh, and an eight there. This was a six. And this was an eight. Oh, now for argument, we can't. I can't remember. Uh, let's say draws would normally be decided by whoever put down their initiative card first. But because it's just me, we'll just roll two d10s. We'll say the blues are for the reds and the yellows are for the blacks. And the blacks take it, so they're winning the tie. 
So, first act is this guy up here. Now, he hasn't taken any actions yet. So mm -hmm. he is going to aim and shoot twice again. Oh, I should have said before, at the end of the turn, all movement markers would come off. So he's going to aim and shoot twice. Now, that fella down there hasn't moved this turn, so because he's acted before him, he gets plus one bonus for aiming. There's no modifiers, so he's actually rolling and getting plus one this time. 17 plus one is an 18. That's close. If you'd have got a 19, as you'd see down here, the guy is just dead outright. So it's entirely possible to kill someone with one shot in this game. So you can just cap them, they just fall off a building. Uh, lucky hit. So that is a hit and a nerve test. So if you remember I said a nerve test was a D10 plus the number of markers you've taken. We know their nerve is free. He's taken two hits, so he needs five or more. So he passed it. However, he's got another shot to come in. Now the second shot is at minus one. Um, he will, um, So his shoot is normally zero. So this shot is just at minus one. 11, 11 is minus one is 10, that's a miss. So the other shot goes pinging over. So this guy down here is quite lucky that time. Now, the next person to go is this guy. So he is going to try and move into cover behind here. So he's gonna take a move action. Then he's going to aim and he's going to fire at the guy in cover. So we know he's gonna make that. So I'll just move him into there and take his wounds with him. And we know he is within 20 as well. So no modifiers there. And he has moved once. So for his shoot roll, he is going to take a minus two because he's taken two hits. He aimed, which gives him plus one. So he's at minus one. But this guy is in cover. So that's another minus one. So he's at minus two. And that's a big miss. Right, the next to go will be this fella in the church. So he, he's not overly happy with that. So I think what he's going to do is he's going to, he doesn't like the look at that shotgun coming towards him. So he is going to move into the church and he's going to fire out of one of the windows. So he's going to take a move action to this window and then he is going to fire twice out at the guy with the shotgun. So if I measure this out, yeah, he can more than make that. You can move through any windows, you can move up onto scenery. Basically, if this ruler can get to something, you can move up onto it. You can jump between buildings, there's no real tests that have to be taken. So he's gonna fire out twice, and we can see that he is within one rule length, which means he's at point blank range for a pistol. So he moved once, so we'll pop that token on him. And he's gonna fire twice. So. He will get a d20. He has a shoot of zero. He's moved once, which doesn't affect him. This guy hasn't moved yet, but he's at point blank range, which gives him a plus two of a pistol. So his first shot is gonna be at plus two. His second shot, he gets minus one to that. So that means, but he's at point blank range, so he's gonna be at minus one, plus one. So first shot is at plus two. 17, 18, 19. And 19 is an out of action. So he's just running there, poked his gun out and shot him. That's it. He's gone. He's out of the game. All the other shots just carry on. So he just shoots his corpse. And that's it. That's the basics of the game. The only thing that I didn't cover was reloading. So if you roll a natural one, nope, that's a seven. If you roll a natural one, uh, in your combat check, your gun jams or is out of ammo. So even if you took three shots, your turn immediately ends. You put an out of ammo token next to them, and basically you just have to take an action on your following turn to reload it. That's the basics of the game. There is close combat in the game, which is brutal. Um, the way that works is if you've got two guys who are in close combat, they both roll a d10. Uh, the guy who initiated the combat, who charged, basically gets to add plus one. So we say this guy charged, he gets five, this guy got a seven. That means you, the difference is done in wounds. So this guy would take two hits. It is brutal. Um, you, it can be very easy to get unstuck, but primarily this is a game about shooting. Um, and that's it. We love this game. I probably play this more than any other game um, with the sort of the gaming group we've got. Everyone that we've introduced to this game has then gone and bought a set. To play the game, 
you basically only need the rule book, the cards, the tokens and the gang. And I think they do starter deals on there now. Um, you can carry on and get all of these different expansions. The Curse of Dead Man's Hand adds in the, the undead and you can have sort of undead bears running around. Oh, there's just some roster sheets for the, our campaign that we started, but sort of died because of uh, people's schedules, but we'll carry on. Um, you can see this one adds a guy with a flintlock and a banshee. And there's even an Australian version, so you can have Ned Kelly. This one here, the curse, no, the, the legend of Dead Man's Hand, this adds in the rules for campaign play so that you can uh, like build up your gang, build up your reputation. Uh, a very, very nice little system, no pressure. And that's the main thing about this game. That's my final and why I enjoy it. There is no pressure in this game at all. It's just fun. Anyway, I hope this sort of little reasons why I play walkthrough, whatever, um, has maybe interested you. Um, it's made by Great Escape Games. This isn't sort of me doing anything to try and get them more business. I just think this is a great little game, especially if you're in a club or if you don't have a lot of time. It's very easy to go around someone's house or go and say, do you just want to play Dead Man's Hand? This table genuinely took me three minutes to set up because all the buildings just go straight down. Um, it's really good fun. And if you love a Western, then you should get it. It's fantastic. So I hope you're all well. Um, I've got some more videos coming out over the next couple of weeks that I've planned out. It's a bit of a different content rather than just updates and painting videos. Um, and as I say, as soon as all this is over, I've got a uh, another big battle report for our Wars of the Roses uh, game planned, which will be a conclusion to everything that started last time. Anyway, hope you're all well. Have a good evening. Cheers.